the supernatural as something that isn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. AM 1420. WBSL presents Spooky South Ghost with your hosts, Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here along with the silent assassin, Matt Costa. Science advisor, Matt Moniz, has the night off. Uh... It's a holiday weekend, so, you know, he needs some time off. How was your Thanksgiving, Matt? It was decent. It was quiet, yeah. which is nice. So. Did, did, you, uh, did you eat a lot, or do you find, like, the anticipation I, of it is... I tried to, uh, I tried to uh, not indulge myself too much. That's what I find happens to me all the time is, uh, y- you know, I, I, I get amped up for it all day. I always have to cover a high school game for the newspaper, and I just keep thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. Load up that big first plate. And then just overdo it. So, t- you know, Thanksgiving to me is always over within 15 minutes, <laughs> which is uh, it's a shame because I'm a, I'm a big guy. I can eat a lot of food. It's a lot of turkey and then a lot of Tums yeah. afterwards. I don't really have a lot of uh, digestive issues with the Thanksgiving dinner. It usually seems to sit pretty well with me. It's just you know, whenever anybody's like, oh, anybody want coffee afterwards? I'm like, yeah, no, no coffee. Because <laughs> that's, that's, I know, will give me heartburn, but. So uh, this is Spooky South Coast, where we talk not about our Thanksgiving dinners, but instead about the paranormal each and every Saturday night. And uh, you can also watch us streaming live on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. Here in the studios of WBSM, we sneak in a little video camera and we broadcast video onto the web. And also on the Spooky TV page, you can join in in the chat room there. And we've got a bunch of people in there already, and I'm sure it'll grow during the course of the evening as well. And we want to say hi to everybody out there. And I, I've been talking to our content director, Christopher Balzano, uh, about a few things and some of the ideas that we have for Spooky TV coming up in the future. And I'm excited because basically this gives us carte blanche to have our own paranormal programming on all the time. We're not just going to be limited to the two hours uh, a week that uh, the, the radio station allows us to broadcast, but we can do things all the time. And when we have special events, when we go to different places for different things, we can bring the camera along with us, and wherever there is the possibility of picking up an internet connection, we'll be able to broadcast Spooky TV. We're going to have to do some tests, I think, Matt, to see if we can even connect the laptop to our cell phones and use that to broadcast. I know that uh, with some of the higher-end phones, the uh, service that we use allows you to use your phone as a camera. So uh, when we have friends out in the field who are doing different things, maybe we can have them sign in with their iPhones and their Droid phones and everything. But it's really cool because the page that you designed, Matt, is, is great. You can see the you have the chat window right next to the video window, so you can actually watch what's going on, take part in the conversations in the chat room. And then underneath it, you'll see all the previous shows. Uh, the video from the previous shows are down there. And, of course, we'll get on Matt for not updating <laughs> last week's video on there, but he'll get it up there. And then a little bit further down, you see the mobile apps uh, to be able to listen to the show on your iPhone, your iPad, or your iPod Touch, uh, on your Android phone, on your Windows 7 phone. Those are the apps to, to be able to listen to the show wherever you are. Uh, and then if you want to listen to the uh, – to watch the show, I'm sorry, wherever you are with the Ustream viewer, if you want to just listen to the show, you can use the WBSM live streaming app which is available for uh, Apple iPhones, iPads, and iPod Touches, or for the BlackBerry. And then at the very bottom there, you'll see the Stitcher uh, for your mobile phone. And that uh, is the latest podcast episode of Spooky South Coast. As we update them, it automatically puts the latest one up on Stitcher, and you can find all kinds of other paranormal shows there as well. So it's it's really just a great spot to go and catch up with everything. Uh, I know that some people say that we don't, update things enough some people <laughs> say that when we update three or four e- episodes at a time they don't get to to catch them all well there it is it's all laid out right there for you on spooky tv and uh, it's it's a great great design i'm very very happy with what you did there matt and it's exactly what i envisioned when i told you to make sure you got it done yep <laughs> i'm a taskmaster. <laughs> so uh and with the uh, advent of spooky tv and when we start 
I think we're going to take a little while here to make sure that we, we get things rolling properly here and we get the audience over here because I'm sure some of them are still going over to the old Fate Radio page. And while we highly encourage you to, to watch the Fate Radio programming, uh, we're not with that network anymore. We're going to be here on our own Spooky TV channel. Uh, and then as, as we get everything established and people are coming here, then we can start introducing new shows. And some members of the Spooky family might be branching out into having their own little uh, segments and shows on Spooky TV. So I've, I've got some ideas. And uh, certain people are going to be getting phone calls and emails and Facebook messages from me uh, to see if we can make some of these ideas a reality. Matt Costa, you're speaking of Facebook, you thought I was kidding when I yeah. said I was going to do this, but I'm putting you on the spot here. You finally, after like... What's I it, did three years. <coughs> yeah, that I've been on it. You finally, finally broke down. I did. I was uh, I was kind of tired of people talking about Facebook, so I figured I would go on it, kill it, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> once you join, it goes downhill. I did. I did that with MySpace. As soon as I joined MySpace, MySpace <laughs> then nobody used it. So, well, the good thing is, is you're gonna have like a thousand Farmville requests now. People are gonna want to give yeah. you things in I, Farmville. I'm I don't. Not, I don't I'm do not, that stuff. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm intrigued. Really, because I don't know what it no. is. But I can tell you that uh, one of the potential guests that we're going to have on next week, uh, Felix Silla, the actor who played Cousin It on The Addams Family and who's coming to the South Coast Orient Comic Show on December 6th at the Seaport Inn in Fairhaven, he's on Facebook. And he's a big Farmville guy, apparently, from <laughs> his Facebook account. So, And uh, you might, you know, anybody that's out there that's on Facebook, friend request Matt Costa. And did you send me a request? Because I didn't. No, not yet. I just got a message from you. I didn't. I was going to surprise you. Oh, okay. And uh, <laughs> and if you go on there, you you can see uh, Matt that I have a lot of our listeners and a lot of our guests and everything are my friends. So feel free to go in there and what do they call it when you go mining through somebody else's account for friends? I don't know. <laughs> well, you can start doing that, and uh, you'll you'll maybe get some more some more friends friend that way. Farming. Yes. Friend farming, sure. Friend farmville. <laughs> And uh, uh, there's there's a new friend that I put uh, I put out a request to today, so hopefully she responds. Uh, and you might want to jump on this one as well, Danielle Harris. Uh. Yes, who <laughs> you've met and uh, who I'm sure was infatuated with you. Is uh, the 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 cool thing about these social apps is you, you know you can get closer to the quote unquote celebrities, and you do have a chance to find out what they're thinking, uh, what's going on in their lives, and interact with them a little bit and in addition to Facebook, Twitter is another one where you can really get up a close and personal in 140 characters or less. So I've had my own personal Twitter for a while. I, I usually update the Spooky South Coast one with whoever the guests are and whatever's going on with the show. But I've also had my own personal one, at Tim Weisberg, for a while. And I was originally using it like when I went out to Celtics games and Patriots games. I was kind of updating it, but I found that I have so many responsibilities when I'm working, that I can't really stop and do the Twitter thing, too, also because it takes me forever to actually type out tweets and everything, so even doing it on my laptop. So, uh, you know, these other bigger newspapers, they have people who just do that as part of their job. So I kind of abandon that pretty quickly, and it just sits there and goes dormant, and nothing happens. <laughs> and I get emails from people saying, hey, how come you don't post what's going on? Hey, how, you know, we want to get to know you as a person. Well... Matt, you know me as a person. I'm really not that <laughs> interesting. It's definitely not anything worth yeah, tweeting about. There are a few moments, I guess. Yeah. We all do. What, th what, I, what I finally broke down and decided is, is somebody it actually... Is it 140 characters worth? I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of characters to deal with. But uh, some somebody did send me an email saying, look, you use your Twitter account to always push your book. It goes to the South Coast. Available at a bookstore near you, also on Amazon.com and SpookySouthCoast.com. And I have just a few copies left here at the studio. If you want to come down here and pick one up tonight, you can get it signed. It makes a great stocking stuff for $19.99. But uh, anyway, so I'm always putting updates about book signings and things like that. But they're like, you never tell us anything about you. Well, you're going to be sorry now. <laughs> because now I'm going to. So not only do you have to listen to, you know, read stupid updates about whatever I'm doing with my day, but you're also going to have to deal with my supposedly witty insights to things as well. And you know for a fact, Matt, that sometimes uh, I come out with some gems, but for the most part, it's just mindless diarrhea of the mouth. That's fine. Well, now it's going to be diarrhea of the tweets. So if you uh, follow me, I think it's called following when you follow when you want to know what somebody's tweeting. I think if you follow okay. me on Twitter, it's at Tim Weisberg. And I figure if I don't keep it active, then uh, sooner or later I'm going to get that flute player who's going to call me up and be like, hey, 
Can I have that Twitter <laughs> account? Because you're not doing anything with it. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Yep. That was a great <laughs> album. But I, I mean, I sat there. Uh, I, I sat there and waited for years to buy TimWeisberg.com, and he finally beat me to it. And it's like, oh, right when I was getting ready to put the website together, well, I'll have you put together the website for the book. I find out, coming soon, timweisberg.com. Yeah. So I get people all the time that think that I'm him. I wonder if he ever gets people that think that he's me. I don't know. I doubt it. And then the, to make matters worse, there's another Tim Weisberg who's also a sports writer. He worked for his college newspaper, and now he, he writes a sports blog. So And he, he doesn't hold back his opinions. And he's writing a blog, so he's not really – you know, restrained as somebody in print would be. So he kind of says whatever's on his mind. So I'm just waiting till I go to interview somebody. And it's like, oh, Tim Weisberg. Oh, you're that Tim Weisberg? No, I'm not that Tim Weisberg. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, the few interesting stories about my life. Matt Costa, you're, you're named after a, a musician. Isn't yeah. he a surf, surfer too? I don't know. Musician and surfer? <coughs> I don't know. It's kind of a wuss. I know yeah. that. And uh, there's there's about 35 other Matt Costas here in the South Coast that I know of. Is there? Damn. Yeah. So you're not, that's I mean, right. at least I'm I, the only Tim Weisberg in the area. That's right. I have that Matt Costa at Facebook or Facebook. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's what you use it for? Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you try to get tw- uh, Twitter, uh, if you ever make that move, try to get the real Matt Costa. And then argue that your celebrity <laughs> is better, is bigger than the yeah. singer. Why should I change my name? He's the one who sucks. <laughs> exactly. I want to know, like, who at Twitter makes that decision as to who is the more important person with the name. Like, yeah. do they have, like, an, a, an executive board or, like, a review panel? Is who it first d- come, first serve? I don't know. No, because, I mean, they, they want you to get the real if you're the yeah. celebrity version. So, nah, well, whatever. I know I'm the real Tim Weisberg on Twitter, but that's only because the other guy, the, f- the flute, you know, he can't play the flute and tweet at the same time <laughs> he tweets with his flute <laughs> not with his phone so all right there you have it well we're going to talk about some paranormal stuff here i promise uh later on in the second hour of the show i i'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book because people have been emailing saying how come you haven't done a ghost of the south coast show well i think every episode of the show is kind of like a ghost of the south coast show we cover a lot of the stories in the book every week and we talk about them every year when we do our Bridgewater Triangle Investigation show. A lot of these sites pop up on that show as well. So, we're, I mean, the phone lines are always open here. And we're always willing to discuss whatever has happened to you, your experiences, uh, what you've heard, uh, what you might know about, what's been passed down within your family or within your group of friends. So the phone lines are always open here at one eight seven seven nine nine six fourteen twenty, 1420 or 508-996-0500. You can also email us spooky crew at spooky south com or jump in the chat room on spooky TV at spooky south com. Great, uh, great banner, by the way. Great icon, link, whatever you call it, to, to direct people to spooky TV on the front page of spooky south com. Yeah. Good work. It's quiet now. Yes, thank you for taking the, the thunder out of there. The thunder <laughs> rolls. Anyway, so. Uh, again, so just feel free to call in with anything you want to talk about regarding the paranormal. But I was. Doing a Google search today for some news, and even though we don't do the week and weird anymore, which it's it's going to be making a comeback, folks. Keep keep your eyes peeled to Spooky TV for that. But I, I always you know try to keep up to date with whatever the spooky news is, and what ends up happening, especially now this time of year, because Paranormal Activity Two just came out. You know, you type paranormal into Google News, and all you get is stuff about the movie. And, you know, apparently now they're making a Paranormal Activity Three, and they're saying that it's the new era parent you know horror franchise and and all this stuff about paranormal activity well a little bit of interesting news did sneak into the to the newswire this week now this comes from uh majestic seven media partners they announced on the 23rd that anomaly the world's first 3d television program to focus on the paranormal and unexplained will soon debut anomaly uses never before seen 3d night vision cameras and new production techniques to immerse viewers in the world's most unusual and frightening locations. The show's one-hour docu-reality format is fast-paced and entertaining. But Anomaly isn't your average things-that-go-bump paranormal show, however. The show's host and lead uh, investigator, Jack uh, Kawasitz... I'm going to assume that that's right. We're going to try and have him on the show, but we'll we'll find out the pr- uh, proper pronunciation. Uh, he brings the same scientific determination that he has demonstrated in his seminal research in human-dolphin communication. 
The technological advances that are helping crack the communication barrier between humans and dolphins also allow us to take a real balanced and scientific look at the paranormal, he said. Jack and his team will continuously innovate and apply new research tools and protocols to filter out explainable phenomena and capture evidence of quantifiably genuine paranormal occurrences. Well, okay, that's great. Everybody has their own approach to how they investigate the paranormal for these reality shows. What is fascinating to me is the fact that it's going to be in this 3D format. And they have a website. If you go to uh, anomaly3d.tv, and that's A-N-O-M-A-L-Y, the number three, the letter D, dot TV. And if you go to that website, you can actually download uh, a preview trailer. Now, it's not the 3D that they'll be using for the programming. Uh, it's actually going to be broadcast through this new uh, website, I guess, called Next3D TV. It's internet internet-based 3D video on demand service. And they're hoping to have broader distribution after that. But w basically what this service is, is it's a pay-per-view 3D service. You have to have a 3D monitor. You have to have a 3D graphics card. You have to have the 3D glasses. So it's a lot of stuff to have to have. So it's going to take a while before this takes off. Because it's going to be as people are investing money in 3D, I think 3D computer monitor probably falls like at the bottom of the list. And they'd rather get that 3D television first because there's so much free 3D programming that's going to be available uh, in the coming years. So I think the computer monitors kind of fall by the wayside for right now, but it's interesting that they are making this possible. And I'm not exactly sure of the specifics. Maybe you know, Matt, a little bit better than I do, but I know that the new 3D that they use in theaters, this real D 3D stuff yep. that they use, it has to do with light refraction and all that stuff, and it's it's not necessarily the, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, anal... I don't want to pronounce it wrong. Like anagraph. Ana anaglyph. Glyph. Anaglyph. Uh, the cyan and the blue. Uh, it's not you know th that design anymore, but it's this real D design that they use with the light refraction, which is why the glasses look so different when you go to see like Avatar or something. So, but the previews that they put up there are in the anaglyph 3D format. So I happen to have a pair of those old 3D glasses kicking around. I always do 3D comics and all kinds of stuff like that. So I put it on and I watched it. And what a difference it makes to see a paranormal show in 3D. Now, for those of you who have been on paranormal investigations before and you complain that there isn't a lot of realism uh, to the television programming, uh, part of that is the fact that watching it in that 2D format, you know, you really don't get the room. You know, you only get what the camera is showing you. With the 3D format, you really get inside the room. And it, it made a big difference to me. As somebody who's walked around in the dark and, and used a night vision camera kind of as my guide to see in the dark, uh, it, this feels more like what's on a real investigation. Now, that doesn't mean that the 3D format is going to be any better in terms of presenting evidence. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to see out of the corner of your eye something that you wouldn't have seen in a 2D format, but it's it gives more depth and it definitely immerses you more in the experience of it. And so for those who watch these paranormal reality shows, not for the scientific nature of them, but to kind of get a little thrill and a little chill, this is going to be even better for them because they're going to feel like they're actually there. And I, I don't care if you complain that 3D seems fake, and many many people say that they don't like it because it doesn't seem real. They, it seems like it's artificially projected almost. So even if that's your feeling about 3D, you're still going to enjoy this because no, ma no matter what it is that distracts you about 3D, you can't deny that you become more immersed in the product when it is in 3D. You know what I'm saying? It, it's almost like you're taken into that world and whether or not you process that world as being artificial or being lifelike, you're still brought into it more than you are just watching a picture on a screen. And that's kind of what I got out of watching this uh, preview. It's a pretty good preview. I think it's like a four or five minute preview. So it's uh, I should have brought on my glasses, Matt, so you could have watched it. But it's, um, it's definitely a unique idea. Now, in terms of the actual investigating of the show and the equipment that they use, it looks like they're using some some pretty good stuff uh, from the clip what limited what limited uh, equipment I could see but you know that 
you're going to hit that wall no matter what. I mean, everybody's only going to be able to be so innovative in terms of the equipment that they use. It's how they apply it is what interests me. And whereas Jack Kawasitz is somebody who works in science but works in a completely different area, you know, he might have some new ideas and some new approaches as to how to use that technology. I don't know you don't watch a lot of paranormal TV, Matt. Yeah. But it's been my opinion for the last few years that things have kind of staled in terms of the scientific paranormal investigation on television. Uh, in terms of doing it like Ghost Hunters does it, in terms of doing it like Ghost Lab does it, you know, they've kind of peaked at that science. And no matter... It's too formulaic now? Um. It's well, to some degree, yes, but I think it's also a matter of it's as as the equipment becomes more advanced, which is what we're seeing happen. You know, it's less about using household devices now and more about these specifically designed for the paranormal devices. I think as they move into that stuff for the casual general viewer, it actually becomes less believable mm -hmm. because they don't have the connection with the equipment that they're using when, you know. Ghost Hunters debuted, and Jason and Grant are coming out, and they're like, we have a digital camera, and we have a tape recorder. You know, people are like, yeah, I got those. I could do this. I could try this on my own. Uh, you know, and then they bring in the $10,000 thermal imaging camera, and all of a sudden, everybody wants to go get one. Now, our own Matt Moniz got one this week. He has it. It's in his possession now. <laughs> and he's spending a great deal of money. Now, he got a great deal, don't get me wrong, but it's still spending a great deal of money on this device. To me, I look at it now as what's the evidence that you're going to get? What's the value of that evidence? Is the value of that evidence going to make it worth your while of buying that equipment? In Matt's case, he's in a little bit of a different position. I mean, he, for a number of years, has been a consultant for chemical cleanup. And, and th you know, when people have spills in their home and everything, Matt's somebody that they can get in contact with uh, to help them with that. And so he's going to utilize it in that capacity. You know, he's going to use it for, to help people find leaks in their home and, and things like that. So for him, it's a, a good investment. But for the average paranormal group, are you going to get your money's worth out of the equipment that you're buying? And I'm going to throw the phone lines open to that because we have a lot of uh, investigators that listen to this show. We have a lot of investigators who are in the chat room right now. Is it worth the money? Is it worth spending hundreds of dollars for a lot of the devices um, and not only buying them, but why are you buying them? Are you buying them because you saw them on television? Are you buying them because you believe in what it does? To me, it seems like you can get a lot more mileage out of uh, three, uh, three things. Three things that you can get the most mileage out of. Audio, video, still photography. Now, for a seasoned investigator, that might not be enough because you're looking at it as, okay, I've, I've achieved evidence in those three mediums before. Now I'm looking for a way to achieve something more than that. So then you want to upgrade your equipment. But to the person you're doing the investigation for, whether it be a, a homeowner, a business owner in a private case, or whether it be the general public that you're going to reveal this evidence to, Video, photo, and audio are really all they need. Most people are still having trouble accepting that as evidence of the paranormal. So when you come at them with uh, you know, a still shot of a thermal imaging camera, or if you come at them with you know, Geiger counter readings, they, they, it's all, you know, to, they're just going to listen to what you're saying, shake their head and say, sure, sure. But it's not going to hit home as much as those original three things do. So if that's the case, are you buying equipment solely because it's a cool toy? So 508-996-0500, 1-877-996-1420. Those are the phone numbers. And I understand now, when we're talking about this idea, I understand the concept of buying higher end within those three mediums. For example, our, our friend Mike Markowitz, uh, he has some very high-end audio equipment. Uh, Eric Lavoie of Dartmouth Anomalies Research Team has invested in some high-end audio equipment. 
because they've seen that the most evidence they get comes from that uh, audio range. So for them, it's worth trying to get the clearest, the uh, most precise, and the least disputable evidence that they can in that medium. So for me, I can understand that. And I, you know, being an audio guy myself, I'm always looking for the most high fidelity equipment I can get. And will it make it any easier to explain to somebody that doesn't believe? No. But will it make it easier for me to find those examples? Yes. And that's where I see the value in something like that. Uh, video, as we move into these higher definition camcorders, uh, we have camcorders now that you can get relatively cheap that record in 1080. And you can get a hard drive right on board so you don't have to worry about the problems with magnetic tape. So there's all these advances within that that certainly help you get a clearer picture and therefore an anomaly will show up clearer. I mean, at least that's the, the theory. But when you start bringing in all these other devices, things that you're spending a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand dollars for, is there that value in them? Matt, you've seen a number of different things used in in investigations. We've seen the obelisk. We've seen, yep. you know, the the actual, you know, Frank's boxes. We've seen uh, some other crazy things that weren't really meant for the paranormal that are being applied for it. Being the skeptical person that you are for most of this evidence anyway, do you put more stock in something somebody's giving you if they say, well, this didn't come out of a $25 tape recorder. This came out of a, you know, $5,000 audio detection device. I don't think it matters uh, too much anymore. It seems that you get more results uh, with either recycled or uh, older uh, equipment. So I don't know if that means it's a lower quality uh, piece of equipment that doesn't work as well and the higher end stuff doesn't get... Uh, well, there therein lies the rub. Is the higher end stuff eliminating a lot of the, we'll call it noise, whether it be video noise, audio noise, any kind of distortions. Does the higher end stuff eliminate those distortions that are actually being perceived as paranormal activity that are really just, uh, I don't want to say malfunctions, but just uh, the product of lower grade equipment? You, you know yeah. what I mean? But then there's, there's people like Mike Markowitz who gets uh, high results from the high quality. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I guess it could go either way. Uh, in in my opinion, I mean, if you have the money and you want to spend it on those uh, on that equipment, then by all means, go right ahead. Because chances are, at some point, I'm going to ask you if you can show me how it works and take it on an investigation with me. Say, hey, why don't you come along, bring this, and and show me uh, you know how to apply it in the field. But that's because I'm a, a device guy. I'm a gadget guy by nature. I love seeing cool new things and what they can do. Uh, but for people who are investing their time and their money in this, I mean, most l – let's face it. I mean, I, and I'm not trying to disparage anybody out there. I'm not trying to say that Matt Costa and I have been in this field for, for decades uh, because we haven't been. We've, we've had a, a s serious interest in it for a number of years. But a lot of these groups that are out there now only have come about because of the television programs. And therefore, they are following the – style of investigation that they see presented on these shows so when somebody gets a piece of equipment then therefore the group that's following their lead has to get that equipment as well what ends up happening well you can go to said tv show's website and purchase that equipment now you're not buying it from them of course you're buying it from a paranormal equipment supplier mm -hmm. but there's going to be a percentage given to the website that is hosting it so are you eventually getting into that slippery slope? And like I said, I'm not naming any names here, and I'm not accusing anybody. I'm speaking generalities here. But are you getting to the point where they're using that device as product placement within this television show? Are you basically just buying Coke because you saw your favorite TV personality drinking Coke? And I, I think that that might have a lot to do with it, too. Uh, like I said, you know, it's a kind of a slippery slope because people spend a lot of time learning how to utilize this equipment. They spend a lot of time learning the ins and outs of this equipment. So I don't want to say that they're getting it just because somebody told them to. 
but it's what puts the idea into your head. For example, I mean, I'll, I'll throw this out there, the Faraday cage. How many people out there knew what a Faraday cage was before they saw them use one on Ghost Hunters? Yeah. How many people knew about that? Raise your hands. Matt Moniz, I believe you. <laughs> Everybody else... I kind of scratched my head a little bit because unless you're somebody who's really into the the physics of sound, unless you're somebody who's really into uh, some of these uh, more I don't know, more advanced notions of, of, of sound, then you might not have heard of it. And if you hadn't heard of it, you're not going to know how to apply it into the paranormal. I mean, that's just my my belief is is it basically there's things all around us that could be used as, in the paranormal, but how many of us have looked at them and decided to apply it that way ourselves, or have waited until somebody else suggested it? You know, I have one of those. I'm going to try that too. I go to yard sales, flea markets, pawn shops, you know, rummage sales. I go to all these different things. I'm all I'm a I'm a, a bargain hunter. I'm always looking for some kind of a deal. And when I'm looking for a deal, uh, I'm usually looking for something that's either cool for me to own myself or I'm looking for something that's cool for me to resell. And very rarely do I look outside those two things. But I found that when I go to these different sales or different places, I now find that I'm looking at things, scratching my head and saying, how can that be applied for use in the paranormal? Because it might be that one thing that makes the job simpler as an investigator that doesn't necessarily make more convincing evidence. I mean, uh, you know, uh, w one of the things that I was thinking about that uh, I'm surprised a lot of people haven't jumped on is so many of these uh, motor vehicle DVD players, you know how they have those screens that they put into the back of the chairs mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they're very lightweight and they usually have some kind of a a strap system you know obviously the the more high-end ones are installed but i'm talking about the lower end ones like you would buy in walmart you know that are made to fit any car and they usually have some kind of strap around them that fits around the headrest of the seat in front of you so that you can watch tv and they have the audio uh the audio and the video hookups usually rcas maybe some of them are hdmis or or something a little bit more advanced but how come people aren't taking those and hooking up their their stuff to those and using those instead of everybody walking around using the you know the screen on the camcorder yeah. why not just use that as a monitor the, the complaint about the monitors are well they're not portable you know you're tied down to a monitor and you can only go as far as you can and then people are trying to broadcast wirelessly from the camera to the monitor well that doesn't work because you get a lot of signal interference so you might get something that looks like an anomaly that's really just radio interference so I'm looking at those saying, gee, you know, you can pick those up used really cheap on eBay or on Craigslist or on all these different sites because they're not great for using in the car. They slide around and, you know, they're, they're again, they're attached to the back of the headrest. Why aren't people using these in some fashion? And that's <laughs> something that sooner or later somebody's going to take the same item, the same patent. They're going to start selling it as being a portable paranormal monitoring unit. And they're going to jack the price up about $200. <laughs> That's just how it works. And it's like that in anything. When you when things start becoming specialized for something, then that's when the prices go through the roof. Look at, look at radios, okay? A radio that does everything, H how much different is that? You know, these, these weather bands, uh, you know, TV bands, all these different things. How much different is that from just a regular radio? It's just a few more. It, it's just the ability to to sweep more frequencies. I, I was actually gonna say um, the audio cables that we use, the like the regular headphone cables. Mm -hmm. The uh, if you go to Best Buy, it depends on which section you actually go to. If you go to the iPods, the the cable is gonna be probably twelve dollars. If you go to the back of the store, over by the uh, the the just the regular audio equipment, the same, uh, the same patch cord is going to be six dollars. Yeah, and it's the same exact thing. But except it's one says iPod, exactly, MP3 player, auxiliary thing, and the other one just says audio cable. And not only that, but you're going into Best Buy or uh, or going into Radio Shack or one of these different stores to buy these cables. 
But if you go on websites, and we use them, and you can basically buy the same cable. Now, instead of paying $12 for an iPod cable slash $6 for a regular patch cord, you're now paying $0.35 cents for the same cord. And uh, another fun thing you can do is ask somebody at Best Buy <laughs> <laughs> what the difference is <laughs> and see how many people come over or how many people that they have to ask. <laughs> And, and, and even better than that, though, will be when they start making something up that you know yeah. is not true. <laughs> oh, this one's electronically shielded and yeah. has kryptonite in it. But <laughs> my favorite is uh, the, the value that they place in the fact that the, uh, the connection end is gold-plated. That yeah. apparently makes it worth like an extra $15, $20 uh, in, in stores like that. Look at HDMI cables. J- just Just – do this at some point if if you ever want to really see uh, how much the label has a value. Uh, go to a couple of different stores. Do it while you're out Christmas shopping and price out HDMI cables and see what they charge for the the Monster brand cables. See what they charge for you know Panasonic cables. See what they charge for Rocketfish. You know all these different brands and kind of keep a little notebook of compare and contrast of the different prices. And then look at the specifications of those cables and, and see what the differences are between them. And then when you're done, go home, Google search uh, HDMI cable quality and see which ones are the best deal. Because you know what I've come to find out in searching about HDMI cables? They're all the same. <laughs> yeah. HDMI is HDMI. There is no faster transfer rate over one kind of cable than over another. That's usually what they claim. They claim they'll they'll put high speed data transfer. Well, they're all the same. And I went to I won't say the name of the store, and I asked the differences before I'd taken the time to try to figure it out. And I asked what the difference was, why there are different prices within this own within this store. They have different price structures and price levels. And I got a big, long runaround from somebody who was supposed to know what they were talking about, about all the differences. I'm coming to find out, he was just blowing a lot of hot air. <laughs> so, I mean, I could maybe, maybe there's somebody out there that's an engineer who builds these cables and can tell me that there are little minute differences. Uh, but whatever they are, it's not the difference between a $130 set of HDMI cables and a th- $30 yeah. set or a $10 set or a $3 set. That's the other thing, too, is apparently uh, for each foot that you go longer, that multiplies the price by, like, 10. <laughs> so, no. Is there, uh, is there any piece of paranormal equipment uh, that you really question its usage in the field? Is there any, any piece of equipment that you say, I, uh, I don't really think that that belongs in the paranormal field. I don't really think that that's being used properly. In the paranormal well, field. Nothing off the top of my head, but I, I do question uh, the price of, like, EMF uh, detectors and things like that. Because, mm-hmm. I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly uh, they they are used for. Um, I don't know if electrician, electricians use them. You know, call an, ele- call like an electrical supply store and ask them how much they charge for EMF detectors. Yeah. And they're going to say, a what now? <laughs> I I actually called electrical p- supply stores to try to find because I you know try to find them cheaper yeah. than what you see them on the quote unquote paranormal websites, and they have no idea what they're used for. Here's something really interesting: the cell sensor, which is the probably the the preeminent brand in the paranormal. Uh, I don't want to get into all the different labels that they put on them. Uh, some of them are called like the ghost sensor, the ghost meter, the you know the, the, there's a whole bunch of different names. It's whatever mm-hmm. little sticker they put on the front of them, but it's all the same design. It's kind of like a, a, a squat version of a figure eight uh, with the little light up end, and you know, you know what I'm talking about. You've seen it. Yep. And it's got like the little clip on end of it, but basically it's called the cell sensor. That's the the original origin of the of the device. You know what that's for? 
What's up? Do you know what that device was created for? No. It was originally created to measure radiation levels emitting from everyday devices. No, no, not radiation. EMF levels emitting from everyday devices. Are our cell phones, and, it, and that's why it's called a cell sensor, because you were supposed to use it to sweep around your cell phone to see what the EMF field was coming out of that to see if that EMF field was negatively impacting your health. It's designed so that you don't use a cell phone that's going to make you sick. That was back when people thought cell phones were going to give you a the tumor. The premise in which that device was created is bogus to begin with. <laughs> it was created for a bogus reason. It was created to play on paranoia and fear about cell phone quote-unquote radiation. Yep. So now this device, now that doesn't mean that it's not being properly applied in the paranormal field. Because sometimes things find their true calling by accident. But here's something that is kind of created on almost a false pretense to begin with that's now being put into the paranormal field. And now we're supposed to take the evidence that it gets as being proof of the paranormal. Now, again, no piece of evidence is ever going to be fully definitive for everybody. No, piece, no one single piece of evidence should ever be definitive proof for you out there. It should be a collection of different data, different experiences, different evidence, uh, kind of an overall general perspective. That is the best way to determine whether or not you really believe in it. Don't just look at one piece of evidence, but look at a collection of it. Look at experimentation over time. That's why I think the work that we've been doing at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast for a number of years is so important because we've been able to show it sustained over time. So now you know that it's not just one particular night there was this one particular anomaly that happened. So just keep that in mind. The equipment that's out there, it's great. It's fun. It's really cool to have. It really impresses people when you open up your paranormal toolbox and you've got all these quote-unquote toys. But are you wisely investing your money? Could your money be better put to use in the paranormal field? Absolutely. Because you could always buy a copy of Ghost of the South Coast, <laughs> which we will talk about coming up in hour number two. Uh, we'll also take more of your calls if you want to get involved in this discussion uh, as well. We're going to have the phone lines open for the entire program, 508-996-0500, 1-877-996-1420. The chat room is up and running on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com, and you can email us, Spooky Crew at SpookySouthCoast.com. And I, I brought, I think, four, four or five books with me tonight. And these are all I have left. Now, there's some more coming because I'm going to be down at the South Coast Toy and Comic Show on December 6th, uh, signing some copies there as well. But this, this is what I have right now. So if you want to get a signed copy as a stocking stuffer, as a Christmas gift, or even as a gift to yourself, you got to come down here to the studios, 22 Sconnecat Neck Road in Fairhaven. Same building as Fun 107. Uh, right there next to the 99 restaurant. Tap on the window under the WBSM logo, and we've got them for sale for $20. And also we want to remind you, next week we're going to have on the show, we're going to be talking not only about the South Coast Toy and Comic Show with some special guests from that event, but we're also going to be talking about Rock for Christmas, which is coming up December 10th at the CD Rec Center in Fall River. That's the old uh, armory building on Bank Street, 72 Bank Street. And we're going to be talking with Wayne Morrison, the organizer of that event, and some of the stars of that. Uh, and hopefully we can get Corey Glover of Living Color to come on with us, Pat Travers. I'm sure Terry Luce of XYZ will be joining us. So these are just some of the acts that are going to be playing Rock for Christmas 14. Tickets for that are only $20, and they help charities here in the South Coast area. So you can go to rock4xmas.com, rock4xmas.com. And if you're on my Facebook, as uh, Tim Weisberg's Facebook, then feel free to go to the events that I'm attending and uh, join up with the Rock for Christmas event page there. Matt Costa, you got to get on that now that you're on the face page and the my book yep. and the space the tweet and all that <laughs> stuff. So uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes following the news to talk about Ghosts of the South Coast and a whole lot more uh, with your calls, your texts, your emails. We'll be back with more here on Spooky South Coast. 
First with local news, talk, and sports. This is WBSM New Bedford, Citadel Broadcasting, AM 1420, WBSM. From ABC News, I'm Chuck Sievertson. Chaos inside a mall in suburban Detroit as police say rival groups of teenagers got into a fight which led to a shooting. Holiday shoppers at the Eastland Mall ran for cover or exits. Police shut the place down as they searched for the gunman. Two people were critically injured, says Deputy Police Chief Jim Burke. The group that comprised the shooters uh, fled out of the mall into a silver Buick Century, and they were last seen westbound on 8 Mile Road towards Detroit. The Deputy Police Chief estimated the teenagers about a dozen or so or about 18 to 20 years old. As joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises are now underway in the Yellow Sea west of South Korea, more warnings from North Korea to not cross into its waters or else. Arrested in a police FBI sting in Portland, Oregon, an alleged homegrown terrorist reaction from the Muslim community, Imam Michael Shabazz. Shock that something was being planned of this nature in our city and a sense of uh, relief that this uh, plot was just that, a plot. A Somalian-born, naturalized U.S. citizen, a teenager, arrested, accused of plotting to set off a car bomb at last night's Portland Christmas tree lighting. Police and the FBI say they intercepted the plot in the planning stages and undercover supplied the teen with fake materials. Federal cyber cops have seized and shut down scores of copyrighted music file-sharing websites in the past day, according to ABC's Daria Albinger. The Department of Homeland Security says TorrentFinder.com was peddling counterfeit content in addition to illegal media files, but it didn't have a court order. Reporter Jolie O'Dell with Mashable.com. It kind of goes above the laws that exist now. Um, or you just take someone's website away, you don't notify them, it's just all gone. She's not sure it accomplishes anything. The websites are opening up again with different domains, like torrentfinder.com became torrentfinder.info, and it's all still there. So far, 77 sites have been shut down. Our Daria Albinger, and you're listening to ABC News. Sally Field talks about getting a month of Boniva free. If you have osteoporosis, check out the My Boniva program. It's free to join and shows you lots of ways to help improve your bone strength. Boniva works with your body to help stop and reverse bone loss. And My Boniva gives you calcium-rich recipes, monthly reminders, and even a month of Boniva free. Once monthly Boniva is a 150 milligram prescription tablet to treat and prevent postmenopausal osteoporosis. See our ad in Weight Watchers. Don't take Boniva ibandronate sodium if you have problems with your esophagus, low blood calcium, severe kidney disease, or can't sit or stand for at least one hour. Follow dosing instructions carefully. Stop taking Boniva and tell your doctor if you have difficult or painful swallowing, chest pain, or severe or continuing heartburn, as these may be signs of serious upper digestive problems. If jaw problems or severe bone, joint, and or muscle pain develop, tell your doctor. Ask your doctor if Boniva can help you stop Stop losing and start reversing. And check out the My Boniva program. Join today and get a free month of Boniva if eligible at MyBoniva.com or call 1-888-MY-BONIVA. If you missed Black Friday shopping or the deals didn't loosen your grip, Cyber Monday's ahead. Wall Street Journal columnist and ABC News contributor Wendy Bounds on the online discounts. About 9 in 10 retailers, according to the National Retail Federation, will have a promotion on Cyber Monday. Huge discounts that you can do and you can shop online. Black Friday sales figures are due out tomorrow. Early data indicates a modest increase, but overall strong sales since Halloween. <laughs> Tens of thousands, including students and members of Italy's largest labor union, marched through the streets of Rome, holding red flags, demanding more rights for workers, and accusing Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi's government of cutting welfare and education spending while doing little to spur economic growth and employment. Uh, tight fiscal policies helped Italy weather the global financial crisis better than most European nations. The Italian leader faces a confidence vote next month that could lead to early elections. Iranian officials thwarted a hijacking attempt on a commercial flight from Iran to Syria today. ABC's Lara Satrakian says the plane was carrying Iranian officials. The would-be hijacker claimed to have a bomb on board and tried to take over the plane. He was identified as an anti-revolutionary element, a phrase used for opponents of Iran's Islamic regime. ABC's Lara Satrakian in Dubai. In the irony department, Tacoma, Washington's new water testing laboratory, the Center for Urban Waters, has sprung a leak. Recent cold weather froze pipes, a thawing one burst, flooding three floors. This is ABC News. Mortgages should be illegal because you're getting robbed every month. With a typical $200,000 30-year mortgage, you'll end up paying over $400,000 after interest. Hi, I'm John Commuta, creator of the Transforming Debt into Wealth system. My proven system can eliminate your mortgage and all your debts. Let me send you a powerful free CD. 
For your free CD, call 1-800-618-4001. 1-800-618-4001. 1-800-618-4001. Chuck Sievertson, ABC News. Hi, I'm Brett Michaels for the American Diabetes Association. Diabetes is a constant battle. Testing, treating, fighting to live a normal life. I know, I've had diabetes since I was six years old. A lot of people don't think it's deadly, but diabetes kills more Americans each year than breast cancer and AIDS combined. It's been called a silent epidemic, and without your help, it will keep getting worse. Please join me in the movement to stop diabetes. Share your passion and your story. Get involved in local events like the Tour de Cure or the Step Out Walk. Learn how you can better manage this disease or reduce your odds of developing it. And give what you can to help us spread the word and fund programs like the Diabetes Camps for Kids and research to find a cure. Join the movement at StopDiabetes.com. Help us fight a deadly disease that shortens and burdens the lives of millions of Americans. Together, we can stop diabetes. You can't find Pandora jewelry everywhere, but now you can find it at Jared, the Galleria of Jewelry. That's Jared! Whether you're looking for bracelets, beads, earrings, or charms, you'll find the Pandora collection at Jared to be truly remarkable, with literally hundreds of designs. Only the store with five times the selection of ordinary jewelry stores could bring you a Pandora collection like this. Life has its moments. Make them unforgettable with Pandora jewelry at Jared. It can only be Jared! AM 1420, WBSM, your home for New England Patriots football. Every game, every play. Gil Santos calls the action right here on AM 1420. Patriots football, sponsored by BMW of Newport, beautiful homes of New Bedford, and New Bedford floor covering. The New England Patriots, don't miss a play. AM 1420, WBSM. Elise, come on, it's game day. You've got all weekend to study. Jen, this has nothing to do with studying. I've got to work. The way the economy is, I figure I'll be working for the next century just to pay off these student loans. Well, you know... I know, I know. You joined the National Guard, so your college is completely paid for. Yes, you've mentioned it a couple thousand times. The National Guard scholarship covers up to 100% of your tuition. Learn more at nationalguard.com. Sponsored by the Massachusetts National Guard. Aired by the Massachusetts Broadcasters Association and this station. Good. <laughs> but not by him, I can tell you. I don't, like, I don't trust that Johnny Big Guy. I don't want to give you a massage, sir. Yeah, thank you. But we got a beautiful blonde out here that might be able to do that. I know. I saw her out there. Oh, yeah. Is she single? She's uh, Yeah, I, I do. AM 1420, where help is just a phone call away when you have questions about your car. All About Cars with Ralph Medeiros of Ralph's Auto Center is on every Saturday morning from 10 till noon. What to buy, how to fix what you've got, the latest news and recalls. All About Cars with Ralph Medeiros every Saturday morning at 10 on AM 1420 WPSM. Spooky South Coast is back. It's Saturday night. I have no date. A two-liter bottle of Shasta and my all-rush mixtape. Let's rock. I can smell your I'm not afraid. You will. supernatural or something that isn't supposed to happen. Welcome back. Hour number two of Spooky South Coast and 
we've actually been rolling with the discussion here as we talk about the paranormal each and every Saturday night. And tonight we were talking about some of the equipment uh, that you can buy for the paranormal and whether or not it's worth it. One thing that's definitely worth it is this high-definition webcam that we bought to be able to broadcast Spooky TV on SpookySouthCoast.com. So while you're listening to us on the radio, you can also watch us, see what's going on in the studio here. And so we say hi to everybody that's in the chat room on Spooky TV. Uh, we've got the regular gang all in there. And, uh, of course, the discussion always tends to drift not only to what we're talking about here, uh, but also uh, many other topics that they discuss in there as well. So, And sometimes we bring that onto the show. Sometimes that goes on even after the show has gone off the air. And that's why we like Spooky TV, and that's why we're going to be doing more with it uh, in the coming months. So stay tuned to that. And uh, also... You can sign up for my Twitter account, at Tim Weisberg, to get my now multiple daily tweets, I hope. I don't know. It depends. It depends on how I feel about doing it. But And uh, you can also join Matt Costa's Facebook page. And uh, mm. I wonder if you can... Uh, I wonder if you can go from uh, starting Facebook starting Facebook to hating Facebook all in like a 24-hour period, because you might. I might. That might be where yeah. it's going. And... Uh, we're talking here, and I'm going to put you on assignment here, Matt, for a little bit, because you've got that computer over there. My computer's running all the stuff here uh, for the broadcast. But I want you to do me a favor. Find out how much it costs to ship a book, media mail, from Massachusetts to New Zealand. Uh, according to my wife, if you go to the USPS.gov site, they'll give you those kind of rates. And just let me know, because we've got a, a loyal listener in New Zealand that's having trouble getting ghosts of the South Coast. So we'll find out if it's if it's possible for us to ship it over there, because uh, she said she spent $90 to get two paperbacks over there. So, And while I'm a, a, a big supporter of my own book, I don't think that it would be worth spending that kind of money to get your hands on a copy of it. Uh, but uh, we'll see if we can find out the ad information, and you know we'll work something out. I know that uh, a lot of people have come and asked me, you know, hey, I've got a Kindle. Uh, I've got you know a n different e-readers and different e-book readers, and I want to know how I can get it that way. I'm gonna try and find out. I'm gonna try and ask the publisher if it's possible to get it made in that format. As far as I know, they haven't done any of the books in that format. Uh, but as far as I know, you know there isn't a huge international request for them like there is for this book. Toot toot my own horn. Uh, we have a call on the line here, so let's take this call. Good evening. You are on Spooky South Coast. How are you doing? Fine. How are you doing? Oh, we are spooktacular. You guys seem to know a lot about electronics. Try to explain this for you. Okay. Exactly at 1 o'clock in the morning, my phone would ring. Pick it up. Nobody's on it. Next day, it ring again. So I figured, well, I'll take it and unplug in the back of the, uh, the, the this headset. You can unplug the head space. Mm -hmm. Phone still rang. Next day, exactly 1 o'clock, phone rang. Disconnected from the line. Phone still rang. Put the phone to the next day, same problem. I took the phone, and I have a large uh, cooking pot. I put it in the cooking pot, put the lid on it, still rang. The only way I could stop the phone from ringing at 1 o'clock was disconnect the phone, wrap it in the towel, put it in a plastic bag, and put it in my refrigerator. So, <laughs> well, let me ask you this. What kind of phone was it? Was it a regular phone? Was it a, a like a cordless type phone? Or? No, it's a regular phone, but it's got the memory, you know, the, it's an answering phone. It's got the voice recorder on it and stuff. I've had it for, well, a good 10, 15 years. I got three of them. Because my, my first... It's made by GE. My first thought would be that it's some kind of uh, a programmed alarm, some kind of a programmed notification to go off at that time. Yeah, but when you pick up the phone, there's never anybody on it. Well, that's what I mean. If it was like some sort of program notification within the phone, there wouldn't be anybody calling. It would just be the phone itself that was causing the ring as kind of like a, a reminder or something along those lines. But, I mean, you know the phone better than I. Does it have any kind of option like that? No. This phone has got to be 15, 20 years old. I it, can, it didn't have anything. It was back in that, you know, that far back. And whereas it's not connected to the line, I mean, it's, it's certainly not any kind of signal being sent out by the phone company. No. Um the one other thing that I would ask is, and this is going a little bit now into the uh, into the into the paranormal realm. Um, how, well, first of all, how long has it been happening for? Well, it, has, it stopped now, but it, it it continues for about a month, about a year ago. And 
had anybody recently passed when no. it started happening? Well, my father well, about 20 years ago. That was nobody, nobody recently did I know. Okay. I called the phone company, and they had no explanation for it. Well, they sent somebody out here to check the lines to check. They checked everything. They couldn't figure out why, what was doing it. They had no idea at all why it was doing it. Because there is, there is a phenomena that when people pass, uh, there is a lot of uh, reports of getting phone calls, uh, especially like showing up. With a, oh, is there a caller ID on the phone? No. Okay. Because a lot of times they'll show up like the caller ID of the deceased person's cell phone, and when they answer, there's nobody there. Or it'll be the, you know their home line, nobody there. Uh, it, this happens a lot of times, and a lot of people who are in touch with that other side will tell you that it's it's just a little assurance from a loved one that had passed on, but usually it's tied into somebody who has recently passed. So if you're saying there hadn't been anybody that recently recently passed, I wouldn't even put that to it. Um, just trying no, to there's nobody. No, nothing. Nothing like that happened at all. I was in the hospital for 11 days. And when I call, I come home from the hospital, that's when it starts ringing. Hmm. But, you know, number one, I worked in television for 40 years, so I know electronics. I'm oh, old. really? Yeah. I worked at Channel 6 when we came up here in 1963. I worked at Channel 6. Then I worked at Channel 7 in Boston, Channel 27 in Worcester. So, you know, I know electronics, but uh, I can never understand this thing. Yeah, it's got me stumped, too. I'll, uh, I'll have to put it to our science advisor, Matt Moniz, who took tonight off, and, and see what he thinks. Uh, but you said it's a GE phone? Yeah, it's a GE answering phone. It's an old one. I bought this at uh, Building 19. Oh, it's got to be at least 15 years old. I got three of them, all the same. Uh, it, and this is the only one, that, only one of the three does it? Only one of the three does it. Hmm. Well, if, uh, if, if Matt Moniz has any ideas, maybe we'll have you bring it down to the studio sometime and and now uh, we'll sit here until one o'clock in the morning to see what happens. <laughs> it hasn't done it for a while, but it, you know, but I tell you, for a while it, was, it really bothered me for a while because I figured the first thing, you know, if I unplug it, if I unplug the headset, that would stop it, right? Mm -hmm. Nope, unplug it from the line, still did it. I, the only way I could stop it was to take, disconnect the phone, wrap it in a big towel, put it in a plastic bag, and then put it in the refrigerator. If it rang while I was in the refrigerator, I don't know because I couldn't hear it. <laughs> and, but you uh, know, it's uh, it was quite a thing. I can only imagine what it's like when somebody opens up the fridge to get breakfast and like, yeah, honey, why is the phone? Yeah, the, only, the only problem was I couldn't call WBSM to talk to you guys because the phone. <laughs> I, it, when I took the phone out of the refrigerator, it took two or three hours for it to defrost before I could use it. <laughs> well, that's what they call cold calling. Yeah, I know. So. Yeah, but see, I miss WBSM because I talk to you gentlemen all the time, all the stations, you know. And because uh, I, I know people, most of them that worked in the industry, we all work together, and uh, so. Um, it was quite the thing, but nobody. I went down to Radio Shack, and I went down to, uh, you know, several of the electronic stores. They had no idea what was going on. Hmm. Somebody told me to take the batteries out of it, took the batteries out of it, still did it. Did you try getting in touch with GE? No. Might be worth uh, trying, you know, getting a getting hold of them, letting them know the make and model number. Maybe somebody had a similar experience, and they can... You know, let you know what they think the cause of it is. Probably by when this was made, everybody was in GE. It's probably either retired or dead. That's how old this thing is. <laughs> I think if you look on the back, it says it came over on the Mayflower with Columbus. <laughs> and you bought it at Leachmere. <laughs> yeah, Building 19. <laughs> <laughs> well, Building 19 got it from Leachmere. So yeah, it could be. All right. Well, I mean, we'll see what we can find out. I'll, I'll look it up and see if I can find anything. And I, like I said, we'll ask Matt Moniz as well. Okay. You have a good program. I enjoy it a lot. Well, thank you very much. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Again, if you want to call in at any point during the show, 508-996-0500, 1-877-996-1420. Matt, my theory is maybe that phone ringing every night at 1 o'clock in the morning was just Wayne Morrison trying to sell this gentleman tickets to rock for Christmas. It sounds like Wayne. Yeah, he would call at 1 o'clock in the morning because he's a rock star, so he lives on rock star yeah. hours. So, uh, but go to rock4xmas.com, rock the number 4xmas.com, find out more about that. And, of course, South Coast Toy and Comic Show is coming up. That's southcoasttoyandcomic.com. I just like to keep throwing these uh, little plugs out there for people. All right, well, we had talked about discussing Ghost of the South Coast. We have not done a show yet on the book itself. And mainly because, well, how am I going to interview myself, first of all? Uh, we would have to bring in a special guest host to interview me. That would get really weird and uncomfortable because... You know, who wants to come and interview somebody on their own show? Linda Lynch did a great job with it that time uh, when she 
helped us, you know, help the audience get to know us a, a little bit better. And as Low Battery Dave pointed out in the chat room, yes, Jeff Belanger did interview himself, but uh, that's because, like, really, Jeff will just listen to himself talk all day. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, how are you going to talk about the book? That was kind of the the question. And I also said, you know, I, I want to put it off. I don't want to, you know, give the hard push while we're trying to, you know, we're out there selling the book. So we'll discuss it tonight. We'll talk about some of the sites that are discussed in the book. Uh, for those of you who aren't from the area, you know, we'll do our best to try to convey what these sites are like. And for those of you who are from the area and are familiar with them, please call in, share your experience at these locations. Or if you've had an experience at a location that we don't mention or that isn't in the book, you can call in at any point, 996 500 one eight seven seven nine nine six fourteen twenty. Also, email Spooky Crew at SpookySouthCoast dot com. But let me just go grab the book right here. Hey, wow, the, the dead air tone isn't signaling. I guess that means I'm very noisy. But for those of you watching on Spooky TV, here is the cover of the book. It is Ghost of the South Coast. It is put out by the Haunted America series of the History Press. And, of course, the author is Tim Weisberg. Great guy. Sexy dude. But uh, what I did with this is I tried to compile some of the stories that I've heard over the years uh, doing this program and getting out there and investigating some of these sites and then some Internet research, you know, seeing what some of these haunted locations are that people are talking about and trying to find uh, common themes amongst them. And as I always tell people, and when I started researching it, it was the ghosts that I originally focused on, but the history quickly took over. Now, conveniently, I was writing for the history press, so I knew there was going to have to be a great deal of history as well. But when I started hearing the stories behind a lot of these places, doing the research as to how these towns were founded and how they separated from other towns and the reasons why and some of the strange uh, happenings that go back to the colonial era, there was a lot of threads that started to tie things together. And that's the point of it here. Matt, I know I gave you a copy. Have you read it yet? Have you? I you, perused it. You, you, can, you can be honest with me. I perused it. But, you, and, but you've also been talking about this stuff with me. I, I didn't want to crack the binding, so I read the, the digital <laughs> copy. <laughs> the one that I sent to you? Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, you've been here right by my side all these years when we've talked about this stuff. And you've been out there with me in the field investigating a lot of this stuff. And there really is definitely themes that run through a lot of these. There, there is, uh, especially with King Philip's War, there is a commonality to a lot of these haunts and where they might have originated from. Now, the question is still out there, you know, did King Philip's War cause this activity? Or is this activity just, is King Philip's War just another example of whatever is over this region uh, perpetuating over time? I still can't answer that, but as I'm finding, as you know, as people are coming up to me and sharing with me their own experiences, their own stories, uh, it, it goes beyond just these public sites. These spirits are reaching into private homes and private residences, which, of course, is something that I didn't want to get into uh, when I was writing about it. But let's pick some of the different locations that we can talk about. Throw out a haunted location, Matt, and we'll uh, we'll go to that section of it. Um, Stay away from Lizzie Borden's because we've done so many shows about that, and and I really want people to buy the book so they can hear the theories about what's going just on there. But flip the pages and okay, do do a random point. Yeah. All right, and uh, here. <laughs> well, here's here's some uh, some very interesting stories that we just landed on. Something that we don't cover a lot here on the show, but uh, in the city of New Bedford, there are there's a story associated with New Bedford High School uh, about. A uh, former principal, I'm sorry, of an ele elementary school where a former principal uh, died on the school grounds and is said to haunt that school. And I couldn't find any anything that said that somebody had died within a school. Uh, and the, the other story is that in the high school, somebody hung themselves in the projection booth. And that that spirit is there during different drama productions and different events. And I couldn't even find anybody that I posed it to that I know that go to the school who could kind of 
relate any kind of experience there. Now, with Fairhaven High School, it was a different story. I was able to find students who could tell me numerous ghost reports out of there, but nothing at New Bedford High School. But the same story about that haunt at New Bedford High School's auditorium is also applied to the Zyterian Theater. Somebody hung themselves in the projection booth and still haunt the theater. Uh, and with the, with the Zyterian story, it was actually the former owner who opened it in the 1920s, and when it wasn't as profitable as he thought it was, he hung himself in the projection booth. And another one of the stories that is out there about the Zyterian Theater is that there are rooms without doors, doors without rooms, and hallways that lead to nowhere. And we actually went to an event at the Zyterian a few years ago. You, you didn't go, Matt, though, right? We, no, it wasn't. To the, the Weird Al show? But uh, I actually was asking the staff of the Zyterian about this stuff then, and they refused to allow me to investigate. They, if you, they, they didn't want to show me anything backstage or any of these areas, but they told me that it wasn't true. So I can only go by what they told me and what I've heard from people who have worked there and that these stories aren't true. There is no spirit in the projection booth and there are no mysterious doors. I mean, obviously, every you know theater like that has different rooms that we use for different purposes, uh, but there's no... You know, n no, no, no Winchester Mystery House aspect to the Zyterian Theater. But that doesn't mean that other people haven't had an experience and I just haven't heard about it. So you can always share with me what's going on. Now, is the, the points made here by Nexus in the chat room that theaters are spooky anyway. Well, look at how many theaters there are, not just here in Massachusetts, but everywhere, that do have spirits attached to them. Uh, whether it be uh, the Palladium in Worcester, that has a lot of stories. Um, the Orpheum Theater here in New Bedford, which they're in the process of renovating, uh, my belief is that when they really get going with the renovations, I think that place is going to light up with paranormal activity. Um, for one, it sat dormant for so long, uh, but there's also, uh, you know, the, just the possibility that the spirit's interests are going to be piqued by what goes on there. And they're trying to renovate that to look as it did originally. So that's going to help with the paranormal activity there as well. So theaters, I, I know that I always had a creepy feeling at Cinema 140. But that could have been because it was Cinema 140. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody else ever had any activity there. Uh, but that, you know, that's gone. And so many of these theaters are gone now. You know, uh, now it's it's become all about the mall theaters and the, you know, the bigger uh, multiplexes and you know you have to have the 3d screens and the imax screens and things like that but a lot of the older theaters especially ones that were used for more than just showing films uh, they do have that vibe to them buzzards bay theater was a great one and that seems that that's all done now uh, but that was a, a great one to have those type of stories come out of i mean i'd always heard things about that theater all right why don't we talk about another one if, if anybody has any Sites that they want to discuss, 508-996-0500, 1-877-996-1420. And the deeper we get into this, the more I realize it's probably a bad idea. <laughs> we should have just actually done a regular interview format, but all right, let's go. Blind picking of a site. The Kin Sail Inn. And if, uh, if our friends at um, Dartmouth Anomalies Research Team are listening, they might be able to offer a little bit more insight uh, into this because I know that they've been researching this. But the Kinsale Inn in Mattapoisett, it was formerly known as the Mattapoisett Inn. Uh, it was at one point the oldest seaside, uh, it, it is the oldest seaside inn in the nation, still operating as an inn in its original structure. And it was built in 1799. Uh, it's been a blacksmith shop, a general store, a tavern, two separate dwellings, and numerous other incarnations in the past 200 plus years. Originally built by Joseph Meigs. He wanted to build himself a home and a private spot where himself and weary seafarers could have a drink. And uh, now it has been purchased by the Irish Restaurant Company, and it's run as an Irish pub uh, as well as an inn. Two different spirits that I know of are attached to this property. Now, I've met some people over the last few days who have told me about other spirits that are in the Kinsale Inn, but the two most prominent ones are the sea captain 
who is seen on the uh, on the upper floor looking out the window, uh, and he is supposedly Captain Brian, a Matapoise and whaling captain, uh, who is told through town history as being the first governor of Alaska. Interestingly, I could not find, uh, assuming that this is Charles R. Bryant, who is the sea captain that lives in Matapoiset, uh, the n- no Charles R. Bryant was ever the governor of Alaska. Uh, there was a Charles R. Bryant that was served as a special agent of the Treasury in the early days of Alaska. So maybe that's just a legend taking on a different form. Uh, but he's supposedly the sea captain that's seen there. And also a young girl named Sarah is seen there, which is uh, interesting to me because I saw a report about that uh, on Fox 25 Morning News. They were talking about this little girl, Sarah, that's seen in the Mattapoise and the, the Kinsale Inn. And I had had a psychic tell me before that report when she was eating there uh, with her husband that a little girl spirit had come up to her named Sarah. And was talk- so... You know, this wasn't a case of somebody had seen a report and talked about it. And I know that she didn't share this with the owners because she told me she didn't tell anybody about it because she didn't know um, how to broach the subject to the owners, you know, without sounding like, hey, I'm a psychic. And did you know you have ghosts, which works for some people, but not for this particular psychic. So those are the two spirits that I know of that are there. Now people are, uh, just the other day I was uh, doing a book event, and they're telling me that there's more than that. There's more than one child ghost there. Uh, so maybe there's uh, other people that have heard stories uh, about it. Uh, call in and share on that front. What do you think? Should we keep doing this game? Should we keep picking? Sure, why not? One I want to know if anybody more. in the chat room wants to know about any specific locations. If anybody in the chat room at Spooky TV wants to know about a specific location mentioned in the book, uh, mainly because, y- you know, they're 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 the ones that are always talking about this stuff when it's not our topic of discussion. You know, there's frequent discussion about South Coast Ghosts going on. Uh, Luann is in there uh, from Whaling City Ghosts, and she's sharing some of her information. Uh, Paranormal Pirate is asking about Anawan Rock. Surprisingly, though, not in the book because I my cutoff was Fall River. Ghost of the South Coast. Rehoboth, not the South Coast as it's technically defined. Low Battery Dave wants to know about Battleship Cove. Interesting story about Battleship Cove. I've heard some stories about it, but I did not include it in the book. I, I briefly mentioned it, but I didn't include it in the book because Battleship Cove is not receptive to discussing the paranormal and the dealings that I've had with them, uh, they did not want to, they, they basically shut it down. Um, I had asked if we could come in very discreetly, very privately and conduct an investigation. And they told me that basically, uh, battleship cove is a memorial and a final resting place for some souls and that it would be inappropriate to conduct a paranormal investigation there. Now, I didn't get into the logistics of exactly what it is that a paranormal investigation is, because really, if it's done properly, it's uh, a respectful tribute to those spirits. But, you know, I I didn't want to push the envelope too much. Basically, if they were telling me no, and I could tell that there was no way I was going to talk them out of it either way, even though I think that having a bunch of Cub Scouts run around all night in a sleepover, you know, causing all kinds of trouble i don't think that that's a respectable way of utilizing that but hey everybody has their own opinions so i couldn't really get in there couldn't really get any stories out of them uh and other than people who have reported a passing experience with phantoms on the ship i haven't really heard anything too in depth about battleship cove hopefully someday we can change their minds so and and to f- to further specify too uh, about the Anawan Rock and the Rehoboth stuff, there's already great books that cover all those sites, and I didn't feel like I needed to to go back and cover all that stuff again either. Uh, so you can always find out more of that by reading you know the works of Charles Turk Robinson, Chris Balzano, uh, Lauren Coleman. They cover a lot of the stories coming out of there. So that's where it goes with that. Any other chat room suggestions for Ghosts of the South Coast discussion? I stop and listen. 
to the chat room, <laughs> which is uh, kind of kind of weird. What about you, Matt? No, no places you want to know more about, since now that I know that you haven't read the book. I was I was wondering. Uh, there were a few towns that um, you graced upon, but it didn't seem like there was that many uh, stories that came from. Is that just because there was no? Well, you didn't have contact with people who had paranormal stories, or is that just not a? Uh, well, yeah. that's that's interesting that you mentioned that because Rochester was like that. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of ghost stories that were coming out of Rochester. I kind of co-opted yeah. Hell's I mean, Blazes for I, that. I've heard a few things from Rochester, but it's always like from my cousin's brother. Yep. And it they don't know where the house is, or, or something like that. Or there's Witch Rock, which isn't really anything. Yeah. And when when you're trying to chronicle, and this is something I learned from from guys like Chris Balzano and Jeff Belanger. When you're chronicling that, it's you know you can throw in every story that you've heard, but unless there's more to the story, then it's probably not worth including because there's those my cousins, brothers, uncles, sisters, roommate, those stories can be told about any place. So there has to be a little bit more meat to the story. So that's why I didn't really include a lot of stuff from Rochester, uh, mainly because the few things that I have heard are all private residences, and I, mm-hmm. again I didn't write about private residences in the book. Um, because knowing that this was going to be uh, a huge success, no, <laughs> but no, know, knowing that it was going to be uh, kind of an impetus for people to to want to try to get out and check out some of these places, you know, but, and, and I'm not saying that necessarily about my book, but I'm saying that about all books of this genre. Mm-hmm. When you put out a bunch of different haunted places in a collection like this, people want to get out there and explore them. So I didn't want to put in the private residences that people had been kind enough to share their information with or allowed us to investigate. So I stuck with the public places. But uh, with Rochester, I I mentioned in here, though, that I'd heard a lot of UFO stories, a lot of UFO sightings. And the funny thing about it is they act like it's no big deal uh, in Rochester. Maybe it's just the the type of people that are out there, you know, they're not they're not phased by much. And uh, they that's a lot of the they talk about the lights, you know, the lights that are seen in the sky. Now, they could be UFOs. They could be kind of will of the wisps type of uh, sightings. But there seems to be a lot more of those that I'm hearing than ghost stories. But as I did say, I did co-opt Hell's Blazes Tavern in Middleborough. I kind of pulled that into Rochester because it's right there on the line. That's true. And I, I didn't include Middleborough in the book. So it was a way to make sure that I got the stories from that place in there as well. So, um there are uh, some discussions going on, too, about what the South Coast entails. I kind of described it as the newspaper describes it, because the South Coast is basically a creation of the Standard Times. Mm-hmm. It was our phrase that we kind of made up, and so that was from Wareham to Fall River. Wareham to Westport is how we define it, but I included Fall River because they are part of the South Coast, and it goes up into Lakeville, uh, and it goes up into uh, Asona and Freetown. So th- we did get that stuff in there. Uh, one of the things that I did find interesting was the history of these towns and how they came about. Now, we've discussed on the show in the past Native American beliefs. And we've always said, you know, well, Native Americans believe this. And we're kind of talking out of our rear ends with a lot of that because we we don't know. We're not scholars. We haven't studied Native American spiritual beliefs. We're trying to change that. We're trying to uh, do an episode of the show, and I've been working on some contacts to do this uh, with some help from some of our friends, too, where we can bring on some Native American historians, uh, tribesmen, people who know about what the belief system are of these different uh, Native nations in the area. So we will find out more about that. But we can say that they thought it was laughable, the idea that somebody could own land. And so as the colonists were moving away from Plymouth and kind of branching out more westward Mm -hmm. uh, into the rest of the country, they would work out deals with the natives to purchase their lands. And, you know, the natives were like, "Eh, you know, you just gave us all this worth, you know, stuff that's worth something for land, which nobody can own anyway. Yeah, so they, 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 thought, they thought they were getting a deal. Yeah, they thought they were <laughs> ripping ripping off the English. And you know, maybe for the most part they were because 
not only were they buying the land, but they were buying the ghosts that came along with them and buying the, 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 the haunted nature of the area. And some of the stories that I, I found out are just amazing to me. Like, I didn't realize, for example, how many slaves, former slaves, there were in the Westport Dartmouth area. There was quite a bit. There was actually a group in Dartmouth uh, that fought in the Revolutionary War for our side and petitioned the town of Dartmouth for the right to vote following the revolution. And they were denied, of course, but they, were, they lived as free men, but they didn't have the same rights as the white men. And I was like, well, why is this? Why were there so many slaves here? What was it about this area? Uh, that so many settled here. Well, it turns out that Newport was the, the northern capital of the slave trade. So many of them who had escaped just went across the water and ended up settling in Dartmouth and Westport. So I was unaware of things like that. Something interesting that I found out from the research of this. I also found out um, through this research about Freetown's history. Now, we've talked for a number of years here about the weird vibe in Freetown, the weird connections to the paranormal that that town has. You know, Chris Balzano calls it the most haunted town in America, and, and you know, it's part of this overall cursed land. Well, the people who settled Freetown were a little bit different themselves. The original Freetown purchase, let me, let me make sure that I find find this here because this is uh I don't know I mean whenever anybody asks about the south coast area and what's what's the best place to go and have an experience I always point them to Freetown uh because the the haunts are so interesting and I didn't realize that the actual founding of the town was so interesting itself <laughs> searching through the book Grid section on Dartmouth. Talking about how UMass Dartmouth was uh, built by a, a devil worshiper. Not true. All right. <coughs> okay. In 1659, English settlers paid the sum of, quote, 20 coats, two rugs, two iron pots, two settlers, uh, two kettles, a uh, little kettle, eight pairs of shoes, six pairs of stockings, one dozen hose, not that kind, Matt, one dozen hatchets, and two yards of broadcloth to Massasoit in what was known as Ye Freeman's Purchase. A large tract of land that would eventually split into Fall River and Freetown, including the villages of East Freetown and Asonet. Included in Asonet, sorry, included in the deal was a debt satisfied to John Barnes, which allegedly was a large alcohol tab that Massasoit had racked up in Barnes's tavern. Uh, and here's an interesting note in the Freetown history. This this just sums it up to me right here. In 1699, the town voted to erect a meeting house in order to comply with the laws of the colony, but it wasn't completed until 1713, so it took 14 years to complete this meeting house. It took even longer to find a clergyman to serve the town because they were more liberal in their beliefs and couldn't agree on who would suit the congregation as a whole. So it wasn't until seven, 1747, nearly 50 years after the meeting house was originally began being built, that they finally agreed on someone, and even then they forced him to sign a contract that stated that the town would not pay a salary, and instead he would have to live off donations, which was actually in violation of, com of colonial law at the time, because they did have to provide for that, for that clergyman. But that just shows you that pretty much from the beginning, Freetown has had kind of a different outlook than the other towns in this area. So, you know, that's just an interesting little tidbit that I wouldn't have known. And that you wouldn't have known had you not purchased Ghosts of the South Coast, if you did. Yeah. What do you think? Any other any other places that you want to know about? Well, uh... I don't know. Did you find that you? Uh... I'm making basically I'm making you interview me. <laughs> um, learned more about the different towns around here than you normally oh. would. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean. You know, local history is something that I've always found interesting. 
but never to the point where I got really in depth in researching it. I kind of just would like hear things mm-hmm. and just remember it. But going in there and researching it, like I there's I've gone since the book has been published. I've actually gone and read more things about the towns. Uh, and my eventual goal is when I have the time to go to the different towns and go to their libraries and actually go in. Because, they, you know, they've got books that you can't check out that are, have to stay within the reference section that are really good town histories. And I'd really like to get into that. And I'd like to talk m- with m- more of the historical societies for these towns as well. Because... For all the talk we have about how weird this area is, how weird the South Coast is, how weird this Bridgewater Triangle area is, uh, it's also it, it's a great story for kids to read and to learn. I mean, I'm not saying that's out of this book, but it's a, it's a great way for them to to have an appreciation for this area because. It's not like the other histories that they're reading. It's not like the founding of other towns. Uh, it's not like the way that it's portrayed in the history books that we read in school. For, first of all, most of the stuff that's in this book you're not going to find in your school history book because it's glossed over. Uh, we, we talk all the time about how King Philip's War doesn't really make the history books. And that even though it was such a profound impact in the direction of our country at that time, it doesn't. It's a maybe a passing reference at the fir- in the first chapter of a of a history book. I couldn't believe the the things that I was finding out, uh, just about, for example, uh, you know Bartholomew Gosnold, who is the one who discovered Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and he was one of the first to have interactions with the natives. Uh, finding out about the true history of Squanto. And it, we, as we mentioned last yeah. week, you know that he's supposedly buried in an unmarked grave uh, in Burial Hill in Plymouth. Well, Tom Finn from Colonial Lantern Tours actually called me this week to say he's found some information that says that, that may not be the case. And that when he can get more information to me, we're going to talk about it here on the show. But things like that that I didn't know. These, these characters in history who had no grounds to me to make a connection except for just they were there at that time. You know, so I always wondered, say, as a kid, especially growing up in Plymouth, how was it that Squanto knew how to communicate with the English? What made him the one that made the difference? Uh, I, I never took into account the migration of people, why they left Plymouth and started coming out uh, in this direction. It, it's... I don't know, if you're not into history and if you're not into the area you're not going to turn over those stones but when you do turn over the stones you're going to see a lot of things that are probably universal Uh, there's there's for example in this book we have the weird people you know the the heady greens the ned greens uh the strange characters of the south coast but they're just like the strange characters of where you live uh, there's all these themes that run through the idea of, at least here, a lot of these towns were founded by people trying to escape the Puritan ethic, the Puritanism that was so prevalent in the colony. Well, you know, Pennsylvania was founded by people seeking religious freedom, Rhode Island. You know, so that's a common thread here. But what is it that made these common threads suddenly deter into a world of the paranormal? That's what I found to be the most interesting part about it. I think if you read the book, and I hope that you do, sorry, and when you start realizing what the stories are behind these haunts, you can no longer just look at them as haunted locations. Now, Luann of Wailing City goes, she's in the chat room, and she's talking about some of the different... Uh, investigation she's in but I know for one she's one person that went out there to investigate a lot of these locations in the book and other ones that aren't in the book for the purpose of paranormal discovery for the purpose of the scientific aspect of investigating the paranormal and instead what she's found is basically the ghost of smacked her upside the head 
and said, yes, we are here. You know that we're here. And she, it's become a personal journey for her now. Uh, maybe a little too <laughs> personal, as people will find out when they read her book that's forthcoming. Uh, they'll, they'll find out what kind of trial she's had to go through with this. But she's been kind of sucked in, so to speak. And now it's a part of her. She's a part of it. Uh, Chris Balzano wrote a great uh, epilogue to the book talking about how when you start to investigate the spirits of the South Coast, you become part of the story. And you become part of the legend and you become part of the, uh, the fabric of it. And I think that that's definitely the case. I don't know of any spot that I wrote about here that you can't go and investigate and not feel connected to its history. How many people have had to go, you know, at least locally here, have had to go to these places on field trips for school or for different civic events or because their kid dragged them there? And you go in there and you get the tour and you don't have that appreciation for whatever it is that they're trying to tell you. But when you can learn about the ghosts, you make that connection. And, I, hey, if a school wanted to give this to kids to read as a as a as a additional text to what they're learning i think they'd get a lot more interest in the local history i'm i i'm a student of history i took a lot of history classes in college and in high school and not not to my own horn but i took ap history in high school which is supposed to be not just memorizing names and dates which unfortunately is what a lot of history classes are but it was supposed to be the analysis. And it was supposed to be the recurring themes of history. And I feel almost cheated that our own local history wasn't talked about in those classes because it makes a big difference. To know about what went on here makes a big difference. You understand why things happened in Boston the way they did and Lexington and Concord the way they did when you know what it was like down here a hundred years before that. You know, when you realize that these settlers in this area were already being challenged, not just by, you know, the British government, but also by the natives that they were facing, also by the terrain that they were facing, the new world, uh, you start to see that. <laughs> and I've also come to find one other thing out. I really, really don't like a lot of the colonial settlers. <laughs> I really, really do not side with them in a lot. Of, and maybe it's, you know, people will say it's past lives and things like that. But I feel more of a connection with the native people of this area and what they went through. And that is probably the, the thing that I'll take away from doing this research the most was making that connection more so than than learning the quote-unquote white man's history, but learning not only what we did to the natives, but how we bastardized them as well. So that's my really long answer to your <laughs> question. I forgot what the question was. I don't remember either. <laughs> this is a, this has been an interesting show for, for me as a host because I've never done a program where I just have to talk you know, for two hours. I mean, we, we usually break it up. So I thought I would try something pretty good. So hopefully I haven't put people to sleep with this. But, uh, you know, you hear these other radio shows. I don't know how much talk radio you listen to, but the Glenn Beck shows and all these, like, you know, nightly shows where it's just somebody talking for two hours straight. And God help me, I do not have a voice that people would want to listen to for two <laughs> hours straight. Uh, at least I don't think so. I'm, I'm certainly tired of hearing myself talk most of the time. But you know, if... Again, I know we we make it sound like I joke around a lot with saying, "Hey, come buy the book." You know, I got I I really do only have four or five copies left, but you know, we're kidding around about it about how people need to pick it up. But I want I want everybody out there to buy the book, not because well, certainly not because it's going to make me a lot of money because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the world of publishing, Weisberg. But. Uh, I want people to pick it up and to read it and learn the deeper story to what goes on here. And it's it's almost like 
after doing this and presenting it out there to people, I can step back and say, <coughs> I never thought we could do a show every week on just the South Coast, which was our original start of this show. That's what we were going to talk about. But now knowing the wealth of stories and hearing more stories from people going out and doing book signings, you could. You could fill up a two-hour show every week just talking about the ghosts of the South Coast. And I know that when we do it, it's one of them. It's they're always the more popular episodes because people around the world are interested in our ghosts for some reason. I was having this discussion with a gentleman yesterday. Why is it that people outside the area are so fascinated with our ghosts? They're older. They're cooler. And they're the original American spirit. So yeah, that's <laughs> that's my thoughts on that. So that'll that'll pretty much wrap up our discussion on Ghosts of the South Coast. So now there's there's books here to be uh, to be purchased. You can buy them through Amazon.com. All the local bookstores have them, but especially I know you can get signed copies at Baker Books in Dartmouth, at the Sea Witch in Fairhaven, at the Tyhonet Village Market in Wareham, and at the Old Company Store in Wareham. So, and if you are outside the area and you want to get a signed copy, let me know. Tim at SpookySouthCoast.com. And I'll work something out with the publisher. There, there's the call for ebooks and things like that. We'll work on that as well too. So, should I stop now, shamelessly promoting myself every week? <laughs> every week or just? Uh... Well, every week. It seems like every week that uh, you know I'm 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 pushing this book. Yeah. But hey, I gotta. Yeah. And uh, you know maybe Matt Moniz will write a book, and then we can start pushing his. Incessantly. You gonna write a book? Um, no, probably not. How about you just buy a book of Mad Libs, fill it in, yep. and then sell that? <laughs> do, I I do I have I to give them credit? I would pay to read some of the stuff that you come up with. I think Mad Libs are almost implied that like you can sell them afterwards. Yeah. I think it's like they give up the intellectual property rights once they put it out there. I mean, I'm not sure. That was always my highlight of building 19 trips is getting to leave with like four or five Mad Libs books. So, nice, Dave. Nice title for Moniz's book. Gun, <laughs> Guns and Ghosts. Guns and Ghosts. Yeah. All right. Well, next week we'll be back to talk with Wayne Morrison of Rock for Christmas uh, about the upcoming Rock for Christmas 14 coming up December 10th at the CD Rec Center in Fall River. It's the old Bank Street Armory at 72 Bank Street. And uh, it's going to be a great lineup. Uh, Terry Luce of XYZ will be back, of course. Uh, headliners include Pat Travers of the Pat Travers Band. You know their song, Matt. What's their song? Pat Travers Band. The boom, boom. Out go the lights. <laughs> and Corey Glover of Living Color, uh, which you know their big hit, Cult of Personality. And uh, Michael Macera of Loudness. And you can say it because I'm not going to say it. What's that? Ang we young we young young young, Vey. young I, I heard it was young Vey Momstein, <laughs> but I'm not sure if that's totally right. So uh, yeah, I heard it was young Vey. So he'll be there as well. Not not young Vey, but uh, <laughs> M Michael Masser. And uh, I'm trying to think of who else. So the female wrestler, former female wrestler. I know you were on the website there. I can't think of her uh, name. And our friend. Spirit Medium Tiffany Rice will be there doing readings as well. And uh, so you don't want to miss that. Tickets are only $20. They're on sale at the CD Rex on our website, which I believe is fallriveryouthzone.org. But you can get to it from rock4xmas.com. And uh, we'll, we'll have more information about it next week. And then also December 5th, uh, 6th, I'm sorry, at the Seaport Inn and Marina is the South Coast Toy and Comic Show. Tickets to that are only $6. And all over the place, there's uh, dollar off discounts. So there's no reason not to go to both of those great events. Uh, have a great day at the South Coast Touring Comic Show. Maybe we can even get a, 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 we'll talk to the guys and see if we can get a little spot for Wayne. Maybe he can have some tickets for sale there, too. So you can kind of go there and take care of both things all at once. But next week when we have Wayne here, uh, I'm sure he'll have tickets here with him, too, you can buy. So if anybody wants to come down to the studio or make a donation to Rock for Christmas, Either way. So we'll be back then to talk about all that. So until then, for Matt Costa, for Matt Moniz, for Chris Balzano, I'm Tim Weisberg. We want you all to stay spooktacular.
action from the garden and from on the road. Bruins Hockey. Presented by Kitchens and Baths, Ralph's Auto Sales, St. Anne's Credit Union, and by Quality Oil on AM 1420 WBSM. From Wareham to Westport, we've got you covered. AM 1420 WBSM. The latest with local news, talk, and sports. This is WBSM New Bedford, Citadel Broadcasting, AM 1420 WBSM. From ABC News, I'm Hillary Barsky. Prosecutors in Clay, Elise, New York, near Syracuse say Jenny Lynn Watson, a 20-year-old college student who disappeared in her hometown during her Thanksgiving break, was killed by her ex-boyfriend, ABC's Raquel Asa. They have taken into custody uh, a former boyfriend of 21-year-old Jenny Lynn Watson. They went into a bit about of her relationship uh, with the uh, person who was arrested. His name is uh, Stephen Piper. The sheriff's department said that uh, Jenny Lynn uh, had an on and off again relationship with Mr. Piper. Piper made his first court appearance Saturday night in Clay and pleaded not guilty. He's being held without bail. A dispute between two rival groups of teens escalated into gunfire inside of a shopping mall in the Detroit suburb of Harper Woods on Saturday afternoon. Cops say two men were injured after being shot at the Eastland Mall. Deputy Police Chief Jim Burke. One of the victims is an 18-year-old male that was shot in the chest. The other victim is a 35-year-old male. Uh, he's an employee of one of the stores in the mall that was shot in the leg. Officers are still looking for the two gunmen. The U.S. and South Korea launched joint war games Sunday as a top official from North Korea's ally China met South Korea's president in a bid to ease tensions. The Fed's crackdown on file sharing and counterfeiting websites has taken a new turn with government action blocking such sites without any orders from courts. Shutting down the websites isn't really stopping the behavior.